Did you know that time's different when you move at different speeds? That when you move through space, you change the rate at which you move into the future? Well, you can't really notice these differences for everyday speeds, but for really high speeds, like for rockets traveling about half the speed of light, these time differences can be noticed. Let's take a look at the so-called twin paradox. Well, bye. I don't know how to get it. Yeah, I guess maybe we're seeing it. Sure, you know, well, it's all in the dark outside. Well, it is dark. We brought a lunch, you know. Now, while the traveling twin experiences weeks, The stay-at-home twin experiences years. No, I think I'll just sit here and do nothing. Yeah, that sounds like yeah. I'll do that. Oh, what? What? Well, what is going on out there? Oh, my goodness! I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't believe it. I, I can't see you. I would. I, I, I would like to see, see you. I must. Relax and fat. I can't <laughs> relax. I'm too old to relax. <laughs> Look at the size of this one, would you? Could a situation like this be true? You bet it can. This is time dilation. We can see time dilation by comparing clocks from different frames of reference, say from the Earth and from a high-speed rocket ship. Now, a clock can be anything that measures periodic intervals of time. To simplify, we're going to let the ticks of our clock be periodic flashes of light. L look at the light flashes emitted by the stationary rocket ship. Now, some time goes by before they reach the distant planet, but since there's no relative motion involved, successive flashes get to the planet at regularly spaced intervals. That's to say, both the sender and the receiver will agree on the time intervals between the flashes. Now, there's nothing unusual about this. But suppose the rocket ship moves. Look at the Doppler effect. An observer sees the flashes at shorter intervals. Suppose the ship moves fast enough so an observer sees the flashes at intervals twice as short as the ship sends them. Then if the ship moves away just as fast now, an observer is going to see intervals twice as long. Like if the rocket sends a flash every six minutes, they'll be seen every 12 minutes by the observer when the rocket moves away. But every three minutes when the rocket's approaching. Now let's apply this to time dilation. If the ship passes by the Earth and moves away at the same high speed for one hour and quickly turns around and then returns in one hour, rocket ship time, this two-hour trip is seen by the Earth as taking place not in two hours, but in two and a half hours. And this is because the ship and the Earth have been in completely different realms of time. Let's look at this in greater detail. Suppose that when the ship goes by the Earth, that clocks on Earth and on the ship are synchronized to 12 noon. Then as the rocket leaves the Earth, a flash of light is emitted by the ship every six minutes. That's six minutes rocket time. Then the ship emits 10 of these six minute flashes while going away from the Earth. The tenth flash is going to be emitted 60 minutes after leaving the Earth. Then the ship's clock is going to read 1 o'clock just when this tenth flash is emitted. Now suppose this is the moment that the ship turns around. Our Earth observers don't see the turnaround until they see the tenth flash. Now here it comes. It's going to take some time for it to get to them. Closer, closer, closer. Bam, there it is. Ten flashes, 12 minutes apart. That's 120 minutes, two hours. So that means it's two o'clock now on Earth. Now the ten flashes the ship emits when approaching the Earth, they're going to be seen three minutes apart, or all ten in 30 minutes. 
The first is three minutes after two o'clock, Earth time. The next is three minutes later, and so on, until the last flash is emitted just as the ship whizzes past the Earth. And that's going to be 2.30, Earth time. So a clock aboard the rocket ship reads 2 o'clock, while a clock on the Earth reads 2.30. This checks out. Check the figures. Let's go through this once again. Watch carefully and compare the clocks. We'll get the same results if we switch frames of reference. The Earth will send flashes now at six minute intervals, and the rocket ship will observe them while again departing and returning on what for the ship is a two hour journey. One hour out and one hour back. While going away, the ship's gonna see flashes 12 minutes apart. That means it's gonna see a total of five flashes during this hour of going away. See that? Now while returning, the ship sees flashes three minutes apart. It's gonna see a total of 20 during the hour of return. For the round trip then, the Earth emits a total of 25 flashes. At six minute intervals, that's 150 minutes, or two and a half hours. Same results as before. So from either frame of reference, a person on Earth ages more than a person in a high-speed rocket ship. It's not so much a question of who's moving and who isn't, but rather the different space-times experienced. The person on Earth remains in one space-time throughout the experiment, whereas the person in the rocket ship is in a completely different realm of time while traversing space going away from the Earth and in still another realm of time while traversing space and coming back to the Earth. That's two space times. Two space times separated by the acceleration of the ship and turning around. Now that acceleration is interesting in its own right. Get to that in general relativity. But we see that the details of that acceleration aren't really essential in this case. The principal significance of that acceleration is that it marks the changing from one space time to another. Now our twins have been in different space times and they can meet again at the same place in space, 
but only at the expense of time. Isn't that great? That's time dilation. Peace. Where did the time go? Does anybody, does anybody know? When did the day break? Did someone drop it? Was it a mistake? I've got a notion, circular motion, I'm flying out in the ocean. You're watching Sleepcore, Pleasant Dreams. Using vorticity argument, we can see that the vorticity added to the boundary layer by the contraction has had little time to diffuse. So downstream, a larger percentage of the total vorticity is nearer the wall. This results in a relatively thinner boundary layer and higher wall shear stress. On the other hand, in a divergent channel, the boundary layer becomes thicker with a corresponding decrease in wall shear stress. In this case, we have an unfavorable pressure gradient, the increasing pressure associated with a decreasing mainstream velocity decreases the velocity in the boundary layer, so velocity gradients and shear stress are less, and the boundary layer is thicker. At a larger angle, the decrease in velocity is so great that somewhere along the wall, the velocity gradient normal to it becomes zero accompanied by a local reversal of flow immediately downstream of the point. The fluid, which was in the upstream boundary layer, is no longer in contact with the wall and is separated from it by a region of reversed or recirculating flow. The boundary layer is said to have separated. The point on the wall where the fluid in the upstream boundary layer meets the fluid from the region of flow reversal is called the separation point. The wall shear stress is zero there. Here, the point of separation of the laminar boundary layer is near the first wire. The boundary layers we have seen so far have all been laminar. However, in most practical high Reynolds number situations, the boundary layers are not laminar. Rather, they are turbulent. Flow along a cylinder filmed with a high-speed camera can show the stages in the transition of the boundary layer from a laminar one to a turbulent one. A slight adverse pressure gradient causes transition to occur within the field of view. The steps in the transition are very complicated and interdependent. First, there is a growth of nearly two-dimensional waves, the tomain schlichting waves, followed by the appearance and growth of three-dimensional disturbances associated with streamwise vorticity. Then turbulent spots can be seen. 
and finally, fully turbulent flow appears. Here, the exact position where growth of two-dimensional disturbances begins depends on random small-scale fluctuations in the flow and therefore varies with time in a random way. This boundary layer around a channel bend is made turbulent by placing an obstruction in the layer upstream. The obstruction stimulates the naturally occurring processes and hastens the onset of transition. The flow here is all downstream. Removing the trip rod results in separation and backflow. Bubbles accumulate at the separation point. In this diffuser, which was used before, we have made the bottom boundary layer turbulent by inserting a trip rod upstream. The turbulent boundary layer is able to withstand the adverse pressure gradient in the diffuser, while the laminar layer along the top wall is separated, allowing reverse flow. These timelines show that in the turbulent boundary layer, there is no separation. The overall flow is downstream. To see why a turbulent boundary layer can withstand a larger unfavorable pressure gradient without separating, we shall again examine the flow along a flat plate. The boundary layer on the bottom side is laminar and two-dimensional. On the top side, the boundary layer has been tripped by a wire placed well upstream. Unsteady motions in the turbulent boundary layer are three-dimensional. Some of the motions are perpendicular to the plane of view. These timelines correspond closely to the instantaneous velocity profile for the two types of boundary layers. Superimposing a number of displacement lines enables us to obtain a mean velocity profile for the turbulent layer and the laminar layer, and at the same time gives an experimental notion as to where the fluctuations occur and how large they are in the plane of mean motion. In this photograph, we can compare mean laminar and turbulent profiles. Here is the laminar one, the turbulent one and here they are superimposed. The velocity gradient normal to the plate is larger for the turbulent layer and it therefore has the larger wall shear stress or drag. The circulation is the same for both layers. Both boundary layers therefore contain the same amount of vorticity per unit length of the plate. However, the distribution of vorticity in the two layers is very different. There is more vorticity near the plate in the turbulent layer. The distribution of momentum in the two layers is also different. In the turbulent layer, high momentum fluid is moved toward the plate and low momentum fluid is moved away from the plate by unsteady random motions. 
There are larger shear stresses and more momentum in the turbulent boundary layer than in the laminar layer. And the turbulent boundary layer is slightly thicker. In the diffuser, the turbulent boundary layer along the bottom wall does not separate, while the laminar one does, because the three-dimensional interchange between regions of high and low momentum fluid in the turbulent layer is more effective than the molecular diffusion in the laminar layer. Similarly, a turbulent boundary layer on the upper surface of this airfoil prevents large-scale separation or stall until a very high angle of attack. The blades along this wing are called vortex generators. They introduce axial vorticity, which enhances the naturally occurring rotary momentum interchange in the already turbulent boundary layer. Such mixing delays or prevents separation. In this film, we looked at flow along a flat plate and then saw the effect of pressure gradients on boundary layer flow. Now we can understand how this cylinder influences the flow on this plate. Without the plate attached, there is a static pressure increase along the stagnation streamline with a corresponding decrease in velocity. When the plate is attached, a positive pressure gradient is imposed along the plate in the flow direction. This unfavorable pressure gradient causes boundary layer separation and the flow field is radically altered. You're watching Sleepcore. Media for Insomnia. today. We are going to take a field trip to the zoo. And not just any zoo, but our zoo. We have visited the top 10 favorite zoological parks in the country and have brought back our favorite animals to star in this special video zoo. Okay, boys and girls, now let's begin. Have you been to the zoo lately? It's a wonderful place and home to many strange and exotic animals from around the world. The word zoo is short for zoological park. Many parks throughout the country also have botanical gardens with collections of flowers and plants from around the world as well. All of this makes the animals feel right at home. Some of them seem so content that they appear tame, but don't touch. Remember that they are still wild animals. Let's all keep our hands in the bus as we travel from the frontier wilderness of the USA to the tropical rainforest of Central America, from the highlands of Europe to the heart of Africa. Why, we will even visit a few friends from down under along the way. So buckle your seatbelts and hold on to your hats. Come on, everybody. Here we go. We will visit 
visit the reptile house first, and then travel on to the aviary. That's where all of the birds stay here at the zoo. After that, we will cruise up to the African Mesa, and then to the wild frontier. Last stop will be Monkey Island. That's always been my favorite. But remember, if you ever need more time to look at something, you can just stop the tape with your VCR's pause button and study the information a little longer. As we approach each compound of animals, you will see some numbers on the map screen. Mark them down. This is how our interactive video system, IVS, works. They will match the numbers on your VCR's tape meter and act as a road map so you will always know where you are. You will be able to fast forward or rewind anytime you like and visit your favorite animals over and over again. Now let's have some fun. Have you ever seen a pride of lions or a sloth of bears? How about a skulk of foxes or a gang of elk? A kennel of dogs, a clowder of cats, or a gaggle of geese? We'll learn so much together as we visit our favorite animals from the top 10 zoos in the USA. Our first stop will be the reptile house. Lizards belong to the reptile family and are the modern descendants of prehistoric dinosaurs. They live off of bugs and insects and are found worldwide. Lizards range in size from several inches to many feet long. King snakes, like all snakes, are another part of the reptile family. Reptiles are cold-blooded animals, which means that their blood temperature changes with the temperature of their surroundings. King snakes are not poisonous, but often keep areas free of other dangerous snakes. The black-lipped cobra one of the most deadly of all snakes. While most snakes live off small rodents, the cobra can grow to a size of over 18 feet. Snake venom is actually modified saliva and occurs in two types. One that attacks blood vessels and another that damages the nervous system of its prey. are one of the largest reptiles now in existence. Living in both salt and fresh waters around the world in tropical climates, they can grow to over 20 feet long. But these dwarf crocs are so small that they would never pose a threat to any humans. Do you remember the crocodile that chased Captain Hook in the story of Peter Pan? Turtles also live around the world in both salt and freshwater places, and even in the desert where there is no water. Ranging in size from only a few ounces to hundreds of pounds, some turtles have a lifespan of over 100 years. All turtles carry their home on their back and can retreat into their shell for protection from any threat. Who knows the fable of the tortoise and the hare? The emerald tree boa is a constrictor snake. It crushes and suffocates its victims with its mighty coils. This snake's coloring acts as a natural camouflage to aid in the capture of its food. Snakes have very poor eyesight, but a keen sense of smell. When their tongues are flicking about, they are actually tasting the air. Alligators are closely related to the crocodiles and look very similar. One noticeable difference is the more rounded nose of the alligator. It possesses incredibly strong jaws capable of crushing the bones of a full-grown cow.
you're watching Sleepcore. Sleep tight.